Hello and welcome to Electric Sheep episode 6. My name is Paul Andrews and I'm joined in the studio by Carl Sykes. Hello. And Elizabeth Jones. Hello. And our very special guest today is Andrew Williams. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking to Andrew a little bit later on, but um, Andrew is school's ICT strategic manager for Merthyr Canterbury Council. Wow, so his business card's like six foot long. Yes, and, uh, you know. <laughs> but before we get into that, we'll get into our usual weekly roundup. We'll start off with Elizabeth this week. So Elizabeth, what have you been up to? Um, uh, not a lot, actually. I haven't been here terribly <laughs> much of the time. <laughs> um, but I have discovered lots of lovely new things because I've been reading my... Um, RSS feeds a lot, and um, I discovered a, a lovely website called Privacy Fix. All right. Um, and what it does is it checks out your Facebook and Google privacy settings. Mm -hmm. um, so if you just logged into the browser, I would generally already logged into Facebook and Google and all kinds of things. Yeah. And it just checks them out while you're there. You just go onto the website, say, you know, start interrogating. Gotcha. And um, and it runs through them brings up a list of all the privacy settings, the different areas that it can do, mm. and highlights them red or green as to whether you have locked them down or not. And then you can click on those things, whether they're red or green, and go into that setting. And it, it will take you right to the page on the privacy settings in Facebook or Google. Ah, oh, fantastic. And highlight the actual area and tell mm. you what it means if you tick it or don't tick it. Right. And it explains it in plain English. And okay. it takes you through those two websites. Then it'll take you through all the websites that are tracking you via cookies mm -hmm. and um, various other websites that track you in different ways and what that might mean. Um, so it just takes you through all those privacy settings. Even I, who thought I had it locked down pretty good on Facebook, found things that I hadn't shut down because I didn't really understand the language that they'd used on right. the little tick boxes yep. and stuff. You know, and I'm teaching the students how to shut their Facebooks <laughs> down, and I didn't know. Gotcha. So is this a, is this a, is this a browser extension then, or is it a, is it a fully fledged uh, website? It's a, or website a website first, and mm -hmm. then it also has a browser extension. Right. It's definitely on Chrome. I'm not, I think it's on other ones as okay. well. Um, I haven't double checked that. Um, but you can get the extension as well, and then that runs in the background while you're browsing, mm. um, and gives you a little grid of sort of safety with like lots of little green squares, and they go redder as the site gets less private and secure right that's really interesting yeah that, that that's nice i think i think it's very topical i mean not just at the moment but i think it's a, a constant topical thing about the fact that certainly you look talking about students and and perhaps kids in school have got facebook pages you know um privacy and security specifically on facebook is a really important issue and a, a key issue that's highlighted constantly so you know it's nice to be able to have something that might you know, you might be able to direct towards those users and say, well, you know, this is a, a great way to find out if your privacy settings are as good as you think they are. Yes. And if they're not, this is a way to resolve the problems that yeah. you're having. So, Well, I mean, even if you do use the privacy settings, this it, learning about how Facebook and things like that work can really surprise you in, in some ways. Like if you tag someone in one of your posts, their friends can see that post. Right. And people don't realise things like that. So even if you've got your privacy settings locked down, if you use it in a specific way, it opens them back up again. So oh, okay. you need to be aware of how it works in that way as well as using a site like that. Right. And you said there's some other sites. I mean, does it just look at any site you go into in terms of its privacy? No. Or... Oh, oh, any site that you go into in terms of its privacy settings, like um, its official code, like whether it will uh, retain private data after you've deleted your account, right. uh, whether it's got like a security certificate, things like that, like all its policies and it'll just you know run through them and quickly give you an overview but all it does is sit as a little square in the top corner and you can just do a quick check as you're browsing oh, okay um, and it'll pop up and bring you that that those stats if you want them sounds well, really useful am i right in thinking that facebook's just changed its privacy settings as it well? has I think yeah, it yeah. Has, yes. this week if it, yesterday i think it yes. was well we're recording this on the friday but so yeah it was yesterday yeah. uh, <laughs> so it could, could be quite a good, good thing to do now having just had those change in privacy settings. Yeah. Because yeah. Facebook isn't known for kind of giving you all of the scoop on what it does when it changes its privacy right. settings. So, yeah, certainly it, it's well, more yeah, it topical It usually sends you a very, very boring email that yes. you don't read. Yes. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I've had those emails. Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't read them. Yeah. No. <laughs> we'll also put a link to that on the blog, but we'll also put a link to the changes that Facebook have made to their privacy settings as well, if you're interested. Um, it's something that's really important because, I mean, we've we mentioned this previously, when... Facebook's a really great platform, but 
you've got to have your privacy settings locked down um, if you are going to be using it, particularly for education. Um, I know it's something that we, with all the students we have here at the University of Wales Newport, we make a point of saying to them, look, you know, it is your Facebook profile and it is your prerogative because you're all adults and grown-ups, but if you want to know how to lock it down, here's how here's how you can do it. So yeah. it's, it's really great. After I've given them my Facebook safety talk, my general recap is no naked pictures and lock it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true for many things, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you are going to put those pictures on, at least let me vet them. First. Yeah. <laughs> my rule of thumb. <laughs> So, Carl, what have you been up to this week? Uh, well, well, the one thing I wanted to pick out this week, and, and, and actually it couldn't be any less academic if it tried, quite frankly, but it was a really cutesy thing that I found and I quite liked it. Um, a, a member of staff was was asking me about their huge collection of sort of digital photographs that they've been saving up through the years on their desktop of their machine, and they didn't really know what to do with them and have somewhere to put them so they could view them, um, you know, in the in the way you would with an old-fashioned photo album or whatever it might be. So so we had a little look around and um, came up with a really, well, I think it's quite a nice site, um, a thousand memories, uh, dot com is the name the site and essentially they t- they call themselves um, a shoebox for your digital photographs no um, what it does is it allows you to create a number of shoeboxes that you can tag as particular subjects so holidays um, you know whatever they might be um, you upload your photographs into them and essentially it turns it into a, um, a nicely neat um, organized album of the photographs that you've uploaded to their site uh, it's very nice it's completely free uh, and essentially it allows you to do something with the millions of photographs you take on a kind of a weekly monthly basis that you know, either sit on your phone or sit mm. on your desktop and never ever get looked at so mm. um, it's a nice little site and I say it's not, not academic in the slightest but I just thought it was a nice site for people to, to have a little browse through and, and kind of see if it's yeah, something right. they can make use of. Because it's just more usable than things like Flickr. I think so yeah absolutely. I find Flickr kind of ugly in its like clunkiness yeah yeah no you're right absolutely i think so and i mean i you know this this is very much up for the sort of um the fairly less technical user i think mm. you know there's very little involved in other than uploading the photographs and calling your albums what you want to call them it's very very straightforward very simple and really the sort of site that that even the, the most sort of technophobic user could very easily work their way around within a couple of minutes. Um, and we'll put a link to it, obviously, on the site so you can go in and have a little look around. But, um, but yeah, I think it works much nicer than something like Flickr. I mean, and don't get me wrong, that's, that's a great site to oh, use. Yeah, um, and it has its advantages, especially for a kind of, um, you know, perhaps if you're a photography student, you might use a site like that because it gives you lots of options of things you can do with your pictures and make, make your albums look quite nice, yeah, etc. cetera. Exposure um, and... Absolutely. Um, but this is just a really nice hosting site that lets you put up your pictures from your holiday to Spain or wherever you've been and, and kind of just share it with people if you want to, lock it down and make it private. There are great privacy settings in the same way you'd have on your YouTube videos or whatever else. You've got a kind of lockdown private, open to the public or that kind of intermediate setting that you can share links with people and allow them to view it if you want to. So um, definitely worth a little look, just kind of just out of general interest really, more than I'm, I'm sure there's no academic use whatsoever <laughs> for it quite no, frankly. No, I, but... I disagree totally. Oh, okay. It's completely academic use. <laughs> I can see it being used in schools totally. Is you create an album for for this particular project or this particular theme, and, and you stick images in that you've collected. Actually, yeah, you're quite yeah. right because I'm I'm thinking of a, I'm, I'm I'm kind of my head's tuned into kind of the the HG thing, but of course you're talking about schools yeah, specifically, school, aren't you? School, and, yeah. and actually, you're quite right. I mean, in that instance, because it it's got well, I say it's got great security. You might want to you might want to run an Elizabeth security <laughs> privacy <laughs> fixer through it first just yeah. to check. But um, yeah, no, absolutely, it certainly is the sort of thing perhaps you could use in that instance, mm-hmm. and um, it allows for students to upload their photographs and have some where they can go in and view them. It nicely, neatly organises them. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, worthwhile looking at then. Yeah, yeah. We will, we will put, take a look. Yeah, so we'll put a link to it. I mean, just to go on from that, uh, the thing that kind of caught my eye this week, and it's not what, what um, the main thing we'll talk about, um, but I sent it to Canal. Well, we've previously mentioned in another podcast that Carl is a massive kind of Second World War. I was wondering where he was going to go with that. Then. <laughs> Carl is a massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. But um, it just talking Are about you? Flickr. Um, Oh, yeah, 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 I suppose so, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, and I, 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 I we'll put a link to this, and I can't remember the name of the photographer, but what they've done is they found a, like a, a, sh- a real shoebox full of old um, Second World War photographs, and what they uh, to, which were taken around kind of like France, uh, I think it was around different Mostly parts of Amsterdam. Europe, Amsterdam, yeah. yeah. And they st- and then they've gone back to the original places where the photographs have been taken and taken uh, photos as, as they are now, and then they superimposed. The old photographs, the people from the old photographs onto the new photographs. It's re- I mean, it was amazing. It was from a course from like, was it Ghosts of War or yeah, something like yeah. that? It's, it's, we'll put a link up to it, but it's very, very, well, 
A, artistic, but B, I just find it fascinating. It is, yeah, absolutely. It is really fascinating, and it's it's great. They've they've obviously gone to town and very. I mean, the, you, there's no seams on it at all. It's mm. completely seamless the way they've added the pictures in. They've done a great job on it, mm. and uh, you know, for someone who's interested in sort of second world or history or history in general, it's a fantastic site to go mm. and visit. And again, perhaps it's the sort of place you know that I think perhaps schools might want to you know yeah. send kids to and give them a, give them a, a look at you know kind of how things have changed over the last yeah. 40, 50, 60 years, whatever it is, mm. you know. And, so, and yeah. then geotag the photo so you know for if so local folks could know can actually go to that place where it was taken as well mm, so it's cool. it's yeah. it's very very good but we'll put a link to that and that's actually they've done that using Flickr. that's oh, they've got right, the okay. little album on there so it's fantastic i think i think anything that contextualizes contextualizes history is really useful and important to kids because it's so well and good looking at history from history's sake but you mm. need to think about how it's changed and how it's impacted on us now yes yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely well, like, well i suppose because if you look at a photograph from like the second world war or, or, or anything really, it, it doesn't really. I mean, you, you, it's important, but it's, it's quite hard to kind of make a connection to how yeah, it affects yeah. you now. Time but when you see yeah. the same streets, and you're like, oh wow, that's that's it's the same place. Yeah, that's... it's like going around museums. They're very beautiful things, but if you know about something, you can explain it so well mm. that you know one tiny object will become a big deal, and you, it means something if you know something more about it. Yeah. So, yeah, a bit of a tangent, not but the most cogent explanation. <laughs> yeah, but no, definitely worth having it a look at. Just popped into my head yeah. because I thought that that was the, that was definitely the coolest thing I've seen this week on the internet. I was I was very impressed by that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, and we'll kind of jump on slightly now and uh, and get to the section where where Paul's going to tell us about oh. what he's been up to this week. Now, I'm pretty <laughs> I'm pretty certain that for those of you who listened to the last podcast, you'll know that Paul was heading off to to Belfast to uh, give a keynote speech, and I'm sure he's going to give us an update on that. So, how did you get on? Uh, we, I had a lovely time. It was fantastic. I mean, apart um, from the weather, apart from, of course, it, it did chuck it down. Yeah. Um, Hillary Clinton was in town at the same time. Um, so to see your keynote speech, no, sadly not. Oh, no. right. okay. <laughs> okay. Much more important things to do. No, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, the I did the talk at um, Queen's University in Belfast. Beautiful, beautiful buildings. Um, apparently, it, it's it's uh, their equivalent of kind of Ox, Oxbridge, basically over there. But lovely, lovely, um, lovely people, lovely buildings. I had a fantastic time. Met lots of really interesting. Uh, they were basically uh, math teachers and people that support students with mathematics and numeracy in general. So. I mean, this kind of relates to, I suppose, Andrew's area of interest. What, what they were, what they were finding was they were certainly within their education system. They were finding that students had gone through the, the, the school system, and some students had done really well with the maths and understood it, no problem at all. But a significant number of students perhaps hadn't got the kind of the fundamentals down. And so when they were coming on to do other degree courses, not necessarily a maths degree, but maybe something like psychology, for example, um, where there is a statistics component in it. They are finding that a lot of the students there hadn't got the basics in terms of like algebra and formula manipulation and all that, that kind of stuff. So the discussions on the day were very much focused on how can you um, re-engage people at the age of 18, 19, 20, who for whatever reason um, have kind of been disengaged from mathematics and the, and the teaching of mathematics. Um, that. Yeah, <laughs> and it was it was I mean it, it was and everyone there was was really good because they were all very very passionate about what they do they care um, about this that everything they said was always kind of focused on you know the student and making sure they wanted the student to succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, fantastic time. Um, and I've said to them I'd love to go back. Hint hint. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it was just very nice to be invited. I feel very lucky. I mean I, I was I was on the plane going over thinking I'm I'm getting paid to do this. This is. This isn't the worst job in the world, you know. <laughs> this is quite nice. Yeah, well, you know, and I, I've, I've, I've kind of said this in the in the last podcast as well, and it's not because a Paul's my boss will be he happens to be sat next to me at the moment. Um, with a big but knife. having, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But with a, um, you know, how I've been to um, at least one of his keynote speeches, the one that you gave in Leeds last year, mm. um, and it was really well received. And mm. I'm sure that those who were, uh, you know, maths isn't my sort of thing. I've got to say, so maybe it's not <laughs> the sort of presentation I would have liked to sell it. But your 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 audience that were there, who who were there for that particular reason, I think they will have really gained some useful stuff from it. Mm. Can you? me what the title of your presentation was it was no on the spot <laughs> hang on using yeah. technology it, it was it was um enhancing math math enhancing maths using technology right okay um i, I kind of i trimmed it right right the way down but i mean the actual the the thrust of the presentation was basically how, how you can uh, get people re-engaged okay um 
And the main point that I made was actually, it's all about people. And the idea behind the technology is just to say to them, look, this can help you in certain situations. But the most important thing is that people actually come and sit down and work with face to face uh, wherever possible. Right. But obviously, you know, they're, they're sometimes mature students or students with a commitment. They need a bit of help, but they can't physically get to that support worker that, you know, um, so then they can use various tools. I mean, I was showing them things like Skype and join me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, where they could then say, well, okay, if you can't come in, no problem. We'll do a, We can help you a little bit, but if you do want a bit more detailed help, you know, then then come, you know, jump on the bus and come and come and see us, sort of thing. So, um, no, excellent. It, it was it was really good. And have you have you had um, sort of feedback or just kind of either on your talk or just in general? Have you seen any feedback about the the conference in general? I have, yeah. Um, I mean, the the main thing um, I got almost instant feedback via Twitter, which is always very nice. I, yeah. I always I, I don't know about anybody else uh, that does these things, but I always find it very very difficult to gauge how the audience is responding with these things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some people kind of look and smile at everything, but uh, I, when you're doing it to an academic audience, um, they must be very good at poker. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I'm like, well, you know, I'm never quite sure how it goes down. But the, the response on Twitter was, was, was very, very kind. Uh, people were saying very nice things about it. Um, so, yeah, you know, um, and I've, I've put the, the talk, I edited it on the Friday night in my hotel room because that's how I roll people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so exciting wow. yeah i know um but uh, so it, it was up on online uh by the saturday morning so people can watch it again if, if they want to but fantastic the, and i think you've added it onto the electric sheep site already below yes, last week's yeah. podcast haven't you so you know if you want to have a listen then obviously you can just jump jump down one stage from this this podcast and yes, uh yeah. you'll be it's, able to, there to have a listen from there if you yeah. want it yeah and it kind of leads me nicely on to what i've been doing this week which is i mean i, I was lucky enough to be invited to talk to um all of the first year kind of sports students that we've got here at the University of Wales Newport because they're doing a module now on research methods uh, and, and this week's focus was on quantitative research methods i.e. Uh, doing research which gets you numbers back in as opposed to asking people how they feel mm -hmm. you actually get like the data in um, so one of the tools I was showing them was Google Docs forms to actually create online surveys oh, okay because one of the challenges they face is they need to do research and in order for that research to be uh, to have some weight behind it, if you like, they have to have a certain number of responses back from people, like a, like a, like a, crit a critical mass, if you like. Um, and they sometimes find it quite difficult if it's the, if their surveys are on like a piece of paper to actually run around with a clipboard or, or post them out to people. So I was saying, well, look, if you use Google Docs forms, you can do it online. You send the link out to on Facebook or Twitter or you can email people. Folks can then fill that form in and all the data comes into a spreadsheet all typed up nicely for you so you you can get on with the business of analyzing the data for information and not have to key in all the data again um, and the thing that went down the best with them uh, was that this uh, the google uh, system it will live graph the data as it comes in so they're able to spot the patterns and the trends because they're, they're not doing a math degree they're not a sports degree so but they're able to see the pie charts changing in real time and the, and the bar graphs changing in real time to see the information i mean and when i was a math teacher when i know I mean, certainly, you know, I used to teach like GCSE math. We used to do like projects and heights and hand spans and stuff like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, stuff like, yeah, yeah. stuff yeah. like that. And it, yeah. and it was always the challenge of, you know, the students had to get that data from their peers. And it was always quite challenging as to how you got that data. Mm. Uh, whereas if, if I'd have had this kind of a decade ago, this would have been another option, which I think would have been preferred by some people, not all, mm. but by some people, particularly those students who struggle in drawing the graphs. Yeah. Uh, and that presents itself. I mean, it, it's important if you're doing a math qualification, you can do those things. But the interpretation of the graphs can't take place until you've, do, you've until you've drawn them. So it can help, uh, with, you know, kind of speed up that process, so to speak. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll put a we'll put a link to it. <laughs> I'm just furiously writing down. <laughs> I think you're going to show me a note. Then go shut up. You're boring. <laughs> um, um, but it's a Google Docs forms. I will put a link to it. Check it out uh, if you have the time. But it's um, it's something that. The students, I was only in there for about 10, 15 minutes, but their ears pricked up when I showed them that the data would all come into this spreadsheet. And for higher education, because we use um, packages like SPSS yeah. and R. Remember it well. Yeah. Um, so um, when I said to them, well, because it's a spreadsheet, you can export that data into a, an Excel file, mm. which SPSS can then import. So again, you don't have to spend hours keying in the data and run the risk of getting it wrong and all that kind of stuff. So they were quite keen. Um, on that. Oh, bet absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so that's my maths. Lots of math stuff going on with me this week. Excellent, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> 
Okay, so now it's time for us to talk to our very special guest, um, Andrew. Welcome along. I don't feel very special yeah. at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. For having me. Uh, no, it's fantastic joining us. Um, for those uh, folks uh, listening, can you just explain um, what you currently do at the moment, what your job role is? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, the job title does actually says absolutely nothing about what my job is. Agreed. Yeah. So, so uh, I kind of I kind of say it in this way to people: I do IT in schools. Right. Okay. And that, and that kind of simplifies it most of the time. So um, there are. Th- 32 primary and secondary schools in Merthyr Tidville and my job is to try and ensure that they are able to use IT in an effective and innovative way and that there's no barriers in place and I facilitate and um, surprise and innovate. Gotcha. That's so, a lot of schools. It's mm. not a lot of schools. Really? Merthyr is, Merthyr Tidville, I'm sorry, Merthyr Tidville is a small authority. Mm. It really, really is. Monmouth is, is small, Toast Tall Vines, so is Blindly Gwent. And then all of a sudden you go to Cardiff and, and there's a, a much larger concentration of schools as mm. you would expect. But, but um, do they have more people doing your, your role there? Um, that's an interesting question to try and not answer in, in a clear way. I see. <laughs> um, essentially, the, the, the minister has agreed that we have a consortium arrangement now, so all our, all our, lots of our resources are pooled centrally. Right. And there's not a lot of people like me anywhere, let alone in Wales, yeah. um, that, that do what I do currently. Um, so I'm quite unique in that sense, mm. I think. So please correct me if I'm wrong and, and send no. an email to me <laughs> and tell me if you exist as well. I'd quite like to talk to you if there's anyone else out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> just like a lonely heart to have. But, um, so, so essentially, um, you'll, you, obviously you'll have, you'll have good close working relationships with each of those schools. Do they uh, pick up the phone to you and say, we want to do a certain thing? Or do you kind of go to them and go, hey guys you can do these things or is it it's a bit it's a bit of both it's yeah of both. i mean we, we have um a, a really really good school developed school support team mm-hmm. so they they have a lot of the on the ground uh, first and second level support for for technical problems right so some things come through them but they pick up that all their schools are saying we've got a problem with such and such or so and so um and and there's also my kind of developmental uh, in innovative head that's going mm. to school saying I've seen this, I've heard of this, so-and-so showed me this, what do you think? And that's really what, what this year for me has been about, because I've only been in post a year. Mm. So I walked into Merthyr Tidville from Herefordshire and, and Essex previous to that in my teaching life, yeah. and, and sort of went, right, we've got some work to do here then. Um, mm. And, and uh, the, the two big pushes I've had this year, and there's been pushes, and I, I accept that, has been Wi-Fi and mobile technology. Gotcha. There was a big, a big gap in Merthyr Tidville, that actually mm. started to change. So that, that was me saying to schools, I really think you should do that. At the same time, schools are saying to me, well, we're really enjoying what we're doing with our Moodle or, or so on and so forth. Right, okay. I'll stop there. No, no, it's <laughs> fine, it's great. So um, obviously, you know, you'll get these big pushes for, for uh, kind of technologies. Do the pushes tend to be more about the technology rather than the pedagogy? Or is it a case of, um, like, say, for example, I, I mean, going back a couple of years, kind of interactive whiteboards, yeah. um, there was a massive drive to put interactive whiteboards in, in situ mm-hmm. into the classroom. But um, certainly when I was teaching, there, there wasn't necessarily a debate that was had about, well, how are these things actually going to be used? Or is it a case of we'll get the technology in and then go, right, what we're going to do with it? Or The short is, it's a minefield. The short mm. is, is, it's you're right, I mean, the, the IW, IWB interactive whiteboard farce. <laughs> Think all that. Uh, was was an interesting yeah. was was it was really interesting. The Welsh government. I mean, I, I wasn't in Wales at the time. No, no. From what I understand, the Welsh government provided an interactive whiteboard for every school. Mm. One. Yep. On a mobile trolley, and and mm. I know from my own experience that that was massively limiting. But sure. as, but as but as a toy to play with, it was really important that you gave schools the. The, the technology and said, look, this is this is the technology. Now explore how it works. Yeah, and then yes, because if you never have it. one to play with, you'll never see one ever. You'll Absolutely. never get it yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and one one of the things I picked up on before I talk about something else, one of the things I picked up on was that um, quite a lot of schools across the UK, let mm. alone in Wales, are quite insular within their authority, within right, their okay. within their setting, within their local area, mm-hmm. and they don't really, in my experience, look beyond. Um, so the, the BET show, which is a massive educational yeah. technology show yeah. every year in, in January in London, it wasn't really used as a, as a place to go to and find out about stuff, mm-hmm. interesting stuff, trip. to then bring back to. Well, yeah. it, was, it wasn't even attended in some places. Oh. Right. Um, okay. I'm sure there's a number of members of staff, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure there's a number of members of staff who haven't, who've never been to BET and never shown mm. an interest in BET. Yeah. And as a concept, that's exactly what you're outlining, isn't it? Is the idea that you go and have a look, have a play. Mm. Mm. So you can understand it and then bring it back to school well, yeah. and say, I want this. Yeah. 
So you have to get kind of get it's your hands. Cul- it's culture and... shift. It yeah. really is culture shift. I, and interactive whiteboards it, it, eventually are. Ne- oh, well, as we all know, I hope. If you don't, you do now. Interactive <laughs> whiteboards are kind of the essential tool in a classroom. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think they were ever used really effectively in every classroom mm. as an interactive board. They were designed to be, you know, where the kids would come up and play with the board, the adult would play with the board, and use that term loosely. Obviously, I mean learn. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> you can learn from play. Absolutely, yep. And, 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 and in, interact with the board. And, and what's really happened is eventually because they kind of shifted more towards just PowerPoint devices, mm. ways of showing in slideshows mm. and just projectors. Yeah. Um, so they, they never really, in my opinion, they never really, really embedded into interactivity. In my own classroom, I, I hold my hand up to that totally. I, mm. You know, I never really, really use them interactively. Yeah. Mm. But the interesting thing now is, of course, is, is the same cycle almost is, is happening again with, with um, tablet technology. Yeah. yeah. I was waiting for you to say iPad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was it's, trying it's, not to, you see. <laughs> it's really bizarre you said that because we, we had a meeting this morning, actually. One of our colleagues, Lindsay, who uh, you, you kind of know on some of the podcasts and previous podcasts, yeah. was talking about um, the fact that she's working with, with schools and they seem to kind of have, uh, and to quote her words, to have iPads thrown at them, essentially, yeah. But, yeah. but no training behind what you do with these things. So they're great. They've got these flashy sort of tablets that they can use, but above and beyond kind of, playing Angry Birds or whatever it might be, mm. what do you actually do to get the most out of these things? Well, I really hope they're not all playing Angry Birds. Well, no, Either absolutely. There, there isn't actually learning in Angry Birds if you think about it from a point of view of angle and velocity. Mm-hmm. Very true. It's, it's inherent true. learning and you're not you're not uh, aware that you're learning it, which mm-hmm. is interesting. So Very I quite true. like that. There is a place for games in learning. People yep. don't think there is, and there is. Um, but you, you're absolutely, I mean, the, the, the iPad and the iPad is being held up as being almost the saviour of schools and technology yeah. and, and it is the tool for the future but it's mm. it's it's a tool yeah. it's mm. a tablet yeah. it's a way of working it's a set of apps and and i kind of get a, a, a bit i get on my soapbox uh, as schools known in mirtha about it is that it's it's just a tool it's just a, a tablet it's mm. there's android there's there's windows eventually mm. coming along along now you know so there, it's a, it's what has to change is how teachers work that's right. almost more important than the technology. Is, mm. is if you just put a, an iPad into a classroom and have the same pedagogy, the same teaching style, big deal. Is yeah. anything actually going to change? Are the learner outcomes going to change? Mm. I would argue that they won't. So mm. yeah, I, I, yeah, iPad is is the the thing, yeah. the problem, and possibly the solution too. Because if you accept that you can change your teaching style, and if you find the right apps that work, clearly it works. Because there's schools evidencing it now in, in Wales, that, yeah. that I, iPad, and by extension tablet technology, mm. has impact. Yeah. See, I often wonder if people, I mean, um, use the term iPad to actually describe a tablet at times. They don't actually know. Well, yeah. in, in the same way that years ago, I mean, to put my, my gaming head on, that you know, people uh, used to call any games console was a PlayStation yeah. because they didn't know, uh, you know, about the other like the Sega Saturn and stuff. Mm. Very nerdy now, but but Sega Saturn. 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 My wow. Age. Uh, <laughs> but the, but the point was, I mean, I, so I think a lot of the time people and, and you see with the, people use the term podcast as well, and they're not actually doing a podcast; they're sticking audio yeah. on the internet. So I, I don't know if sometimes people say iPad because they mean iPad or they say iPad I think because they mean tablet. They probably say iPad because they mean iPad, but they don't know that there's other ones out there. It's not quite gotten to the level right. of like a Hoover. So it's like brand awareness. Oh, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking of Hoover, actually. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, it is like it. No, I think you're right. It's iPad, it's iPad because iPad's the market leader. Mm. iPad was the first I, to I market. I think the Kindle Fire is going to change that a bit. Because as cool as our Google Nexuses are, they're not well known. Mm. Whereas you can imagine every you know household's going to have a Kindle Fire because everyone's got a well, Kindle. like 99, 99 yeah. pounds Amazon was selling them for a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah. Other yeah. tablets are available. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's in yeah. no way an advert for them. <laughs> no, no, it's, yeah. I, to, to me, it's a, it's, it comes back to this word, and it's, I'm really trying to educate the schools into it. It's a tool. Yeah, mm. it's just a tablet. <laughs> it's, it just ta- touches. It's just a tactile way of doing mm. things. Mm. And, and, and they existed before iPads. Oh, wow, God, mm. do you remember the ones years and years ago? They had the whole flip round screen yeah. on the laptop and the stylus that yeah. the, the Windows were doing. Mm. They were, you know, no one picked up on them then because they were too expensive. Mm. And they, they didn't quite work as well as everyone would have liked them to work. Yeah. I remember seeing one that did, so I was almost amazed. Um, mm. And and the tablets are now so cheap, and the Android, particularly the Android platform, is so cheap mm. to get your devices on. Like, 
it's got to be worthwhile looking at. You know, it's not just a case of going for an iPad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to look at the Kindle Fire. You need to look at the Google mm -hmm. Nexus Seven. I read the statistic that today mm. that Android has like 68% of the mobile yeah. computing market, something yeah. like that. Mm. Like well, because it's huge, it's huge in phones, yeah. isn't it? Mm. We phones did, and tablets. Well, and we stuff. did that thing. I mean, it's, at the university, we, we were, this year we were responsible for doing the IT inductions. And one of the things we wanted to do was do an online IT induction as well as a face-to-face -face one. So we were trying to hit the whole kind of spectrum of people yeah. who were co comfortable with the technology. We'd say, yep, there's a website there crack on and other people who literally wanted to come down and sit with someone for like half an hour 45 minutes to say no look show me this stuff this is all new to me so we we tried to do all that but as part of that we used google analytics to pick up all of the data that was coming in from the students who hadn't yet arrived at the university but they were accessing the yeah, it cool. induction website and um, we found something that was quite surprising but i suppose not not really uh, unexpected when you think about it it was that um over 50% of the students coming in using portable devices were on Android. And so I went back to my my boss and I said, well, look, you know, there's this big, everyone's talking about iTunes U for universities, there's a big yeah, push for yeah, iTunes. Huge. That's a premium market. What are we going to do about all of these students who've got Android phones? Because iTunes doesn't work on that. And so that's been very, I mean, it was very helpful for us because even, I mean, this is going back about four, three or four months ago. So now we are putting things into place to make sure that, we're not just focusing on that kind of iTunes. The iTunes is great. I mean, we, we use it for this podcast, mm. but also making sure that there are other avenues for people who are on other devices. Mm. So they've got access to these things as well. And But I think before that, the assumption was Apple, 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 Apple. And so we were able to show with hard data, uh, yeah. actually, no, this isn't the case. And certainly students that were coming in to the face-to-face -face sessions, we were showing them how to hook their university email up to their uh, their mobile phones and most of the ones we saw i think were android mm. i think mm. is, is that is that a bit like the whole um iphone blackberry scenario that occurred a few years ago wasn't it where, mm. where parents were buying mm. blackberries for their kids because they were cheaper than iphone well, yeah. that came with similar functionality mm. and it's kind of gone again with android is android cheaper i don't know if it is you well you, you can get them for like 15 pound a month on these contracts so you yeah. get an android a nice little android phone uh, and, whereas... and it's slick and it works mm. and i guess some of the some of the earlier versions of android weren't weren't you, know, you can truly, get the new phones sweet. with Android, whereas you can, you nobody wants the iPhone three. Yeah. Once the iPhone four is out. Mm, yeah. Whereas you can get the brand new phone with the brand new Android for less than you would get the the sort of um, equivalent on iPhone. Mm. Mm. It's, def it's definitely price that's pushing the the Android versus iPad mm. yeah. and iOS yeah. it, without any shadow of a doubt. So um, for the schools you're supporting, then how? Um, how do they get exposed to this technology? Uh, is is it a case of saying to them, you've got enthusiasts in in the schools who've got, I've, I've seen this kind of stuff? Or, I mean, I remember years and years ago, uh, it's going back 10 years ago now, I mean, RSC Wales used to come round, that used to come into the schools and colleges with like a big crate full of toys, essentially, cool. and just dump everything on the table. And there was all sorts of, like, there was like big keyboards and big trackboards uh, and uh, uh, things to put over monitors for people with like sight impairments. But it was basically like a roadshow. They'd kind of rock up and dump everything on the table and go, right, have a play for 45 minutes, half an hour, and see, see what you like, see what you don't like, and then we can tell you how much it costs. Uh, they weren't charging. Then, I mean, then your joy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they, but but they were like, don't worry about it. Let's just see what's possible. Yeah. Does that still happen in schools? At the no, moment, not or? that I'm aware of at all. No, no there were no, there's certainly no one organisation going around in the school saying, here's some kit, have a play with it. Here's some kit, have a play with it. Mm. I think there's probably a niche in the marketplace there. Yeah, leave that big space there. <laughs> we're a niche in the marketplace there. Um, but I mean, I, I've seen it happen where we've had uh, individual suppliers have, have given us a load of kit and we've taken mm. that to a few schools and, and shown them that kit. And there's a couple of manufacturers out there who supply sort of the handheld right. stuff. Yeah. The, the, the more toy mm. aspects of technology, sure. as, you know, sound recorders, that kind of stuff. Um, they've given you a load of kit. You can take it and, and play with it. When it comes to iPad and tablet and laptops, no, there isn't. Mm. And generally, what appears, what seems to be happening is that um, individual users in schools are going, oh, I've got this iPad at home. I think it's cool and we can do it this, this and this with it. Yeah. Um, so it's individual users that are driving it. And then there's me coming along here with my great crumping feet and dropping a, an Android tablet on, the, on them and going, oh, there's this too. Mm. Have you considered? There's also um, uh, courses that are being arranged by our consortium on the idea of, of sharing the technology and sharing the good practice. So mm. 
it's, it's a myriad of routes. There is no one route, which I think is probably better because yeah. you don't want a group giving you an opinion. Mm. You want to be able to form your own opinion. And equally, as a as a advisor, I don't want to say to schools, "You will use this." No, mm. that's not that's not why. That's not that's not me. No. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I, I actually kind of very tentatively staying in the same area. I've, I've got I want to ask you about something, and it may be a very quick and quick and simple answer you give me. But um, uh, raspberry pies. Are you uh, finding much use? Any. None at all at the moment. None at all. That, oh, I, I'm. Well, I may have heard a rumor in one of my secondaries. Oh, okay. Mm. But absolutely not in any primary schools. Right. Okay. None whatsoever. And. No one is really talking about them. Right. Okay. In, in Merthyr Tidville. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. specifically there. I mean, yeah. I've seen on Twitter um, there's, there is some work going on there, but they hit, appear to hit the market and then go very quiet. Yeah, yeah I'd kind of like to see them in schools because it's about back to basics computing, isn't it? Yeah. It really is about taking it and code, coding from scratch, Yeah. literally from nothing. And I've seen mm. some interesting stuff on the web that people have done with it. I, mean, I was reading one the other day about someone had set up a remote weather station with a, a, yeah. a Pi. Raspberry Pi as, as the as the power driver for it, mm. right? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Quite like that, but it, no. I mean, we we've got one, um, and ours got ours got snatched up by student services uh, within uh, with under a week, uh, because what we did with ours was I kind of got it, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Raspberry Pi, it's a little it's a tiny little circuit board, and you can put little operating systems on the little SD cards which you can slide in. Yeah. So I I basically had two operating systems um, with it, two SD cards. And one of them was running what's called Xbox Media Center, which basically plays videos and stuff. Um, and it solved the problem of um, they wanted a TV that was wall mounted showing nice. stuff. And um, the, the the challenge they had was like, well, if they put a computer that's worth three hundred pounds, you know, that's that's a significant yeah. cost. Whereas I was able to turn around to the head of student services and go, well, this thing costs you thirty five quid, and you can mount it behind the TV. Mm. And run Xbox Media Center on it, and it can be networked up so you can stream like things from YouTube and make playlists, or you can just have the things on the card. So for those kind of rotating displays, it's quite handy. Wow, I like that. Um, and and it's cheap as well. Um, but come, I mean, even going back a couple of years in the department that we used to be in at the University of Wales Newport, they on similar functionality, they they bought a television with a, a computer built into it. It cost them two and a half thousand pounds. And so now you can get the same functionality using a 99 quid HD TV that you've yeah. bought from wherever yeah. and a 35 pound Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's uh, it, it's that kind of thing, I think, that was quite useful because it was we were able to say, look, uh, if you just put some things on YouTube, we can just pull, we can just stream the content. No, no problem at all. But see, see this is the thing I mean, with a, with, a, with a primary school head on, that's my background, mm. being honest, it's it's. You have to be have a techie member of staff to be really excited yeah, by that. Yeah. You have to have a, a, a techno geek to to get really get in there with it. Mm. And, and I think what we you know in that scenario, I think it's great as a, as a solution to a mm. problem. Really, really brilliant, cost effective, and so, so on. You kind of need somebody to go. There's the SD card. Now buy yeah. the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, and, um, and that's what we did with those guys. Know. I said, here's the Raspberry Pi. Here, it's all set up. Here's the cable. Here's the SD card. All you've got to do is is connect these things up, um, and Tell tell me where which YouTube channel you're going to, and I'll configure it, and then all you've got to do is upload the videos to your YouTube channel, and everything else is, is automated. Yeah, I think you say configure, and everybody goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 very boring. So, so, so when will these be available? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> when, when can we get your SD cards? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. I mean, the Im we'll, again, we'll put links up the image to download Xbox Media Center. You can you can get it now. It's all free. It's all out there. So. So there isn't actually that much techie involvement. Oh no, in it. no, not at all. It was basically a case of uh, just you know get honestly just downloading the image, putting it on the card, and, and making it run. And then it was just it was more about making that connection between I've got some hardware that we that will connect to a TV, and I've got some software that will pull things down from YouTube. What can we use this for? And I mean, I was just playing around with it because we do. I mean, I, I do most of the R and D within the the team, and then kind of it was just a chance conversation with the head of student services who said, "Oh, you know, we really want to do this." And I was like, "Well, hang on a second, come down, come down to the office and have a look at this." Um, and he was like, "That's that's brilliant. That's exactly what I've been looking for." So it's that kind of. That's good. I like of, that. You know, that's, it's exactly what your team does. Yes, yeah. I think so. It's, it's kind of sums, sums you up in a really good way, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly when, when we ordered the Raspberry Pi, I think that, that a lot of people were like, well, why, why are you getting one? And my answer was, I don't know. But I, I, I need to get my hands on this to see what it can do. And there's the full circle background to schools and interactive whiteboards and iPads, isn't it? Mm. It's, I, I have, I have um, 
conversation with people where they go, a school wants to order X, and I say to them, why? Well, because it's there. Mm. You just need to let them order it because we don't know what it will do. Yeah, yeah. maybe don't let them order 50 just yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe probably, one probably good start. Idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then maybe 50. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got schools going about it in a really strategic way, just to get, bring it back to that mm. full circle thing. They've got an iPad and an Android device. Mm. Or is it a Very iPad clever. and an Android mm. device? I'm not sure which. Mm. <laughs> They've got one of each anyway. Yeah. And and they just are, are playing with it. And it's out there with the staff. The staff take it at home. They use mm. it at home. They download the apps. They bring it back to school. They share the apps with the kids. And, you know, maybe six months down the line, they'll have completed some investigations and we'll have four or five apps to use and a way yeah. of using it in the classroom that suits their teaching style. Mm. And then they can order 50. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, not. <laughs> and then here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and then upgrade their bandwidth. Yeah. So, <laughs> who should they charge it to? <laughs> I can't imagine what IT is like in schools anymore. I like, you know, since I was in school. Mm. So dependent on the school. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. Across across Merthyr Tidville and beyond, it's really dependent on the, the head teacher. You get schools that are stuffed with tech, you know, one-to-one iPad devices and mm. they've got Apple TVs on the wall and LCD screens and, you know, interactive whiteboards on three different walls or something, you know, mm. huge, you know mm. total massive tech heads. Yeah. You've got yeah. schools at the opposite end that have a suite of computers that are seven years old. Yeah. Is that, a, is it, do you find that there's a, there are differences in terms of their finances? Is that a factor or is it a case of they've all got roughly the same budgets but people... For whatever reason, choose to spend them in different ways. It's absolutely that. I mean, mm. it comes down to finances. Always comes down to finances and the choices that's, that the head teachers make. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, this is this is my humble opinion. So, apologies if I offend anyone. But you know, heads heads need to begin to think about: is technology important in education? And yeah. My mm. argument is absolutely. It's a basic skill. Yeah. You know, pupils need to leave school, whichever point that is, with an understanding of how technology can be used as a tool to advance their learning. Mm. And okay. it's not just about PC. It's not just about Windows. It should yeah. be about Windows, Linux, uh, Raspberry Pi, yeah. Android. And, and an ideal world, my utopian um, scenario, which is just about being done by one of my primary schools, mm. um, is to have a little bit of everything. Mm. Yeah. So the children are using iPods, are using Android tablets, they're using iPads, yeah. they're going to a computer suite and using a desktop and going to a laptop and using it. Uh, mm. And then, then you, you empower children, I love that word, yeah. you empower children with the knowledge of which tool to choose to do the job they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Off the soapbox now. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, that's true. I mean, I'm fine. I mean, I've got two daughters and I'm finding that with my, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, daddy gets to all the cool toys and he brings them all home and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I know that, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, and, and so they've kind of, even my youngest who's three now uh, has at her disposal, she can play around with an iPod and an iPad mm-hmm. and uh, a Nexus 7 and a laptop and a Mac. And, a, yeah. uh, and, and she will just kind of flip between them depending on what it is she wants to, what it is she wants to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. It's exactly the same for my, my daughter who's four. And, and we have to look, at that generation, don't we? we have to look at the generation now that's beginning to enter school. They're going to be so ahead oh, of their tutors. It's going to be scary, isn't it? Yeah. Because, I mean, what we see, or what I see, is they go, primary school pupils hit primary school, and a good primary school, um, there's technology there. Yeah. And there's technology used in practically every lesson within the day, mm. on practically every day of the school year. And they get to the end of their primary education and in this completely technologically immersive world and, and the tools are at their disposal mm. and, you know, yada, yada. And then they move to secondary school. And yeah. at secondary school, it downgrades. There's that, an IT suite. It's back to an IT suite. Yep. There's no iPads. Mm. There's no laptops. There's, there's poor Wi-Fi connectivity at mm. all. And I'm not saying that's it in every case, clearly. I'm just, it's just sort of outlying sure. a generalistic scenario. Yeah. And at the end of their, their secondary school, they then move on to FE or HE. Mm. And again, there's a shift in technological usage. Mm. It kind of becomes their responsibility as pupils or mm. students at, at, that, at that time. Well, if they don't know what to use, if they haven't got any experience of it, how are they going to make a good decision about what tool to use? Yeah. No, I'd I agree with that. No, I, I'd agree. No, we get I, on it quite a yeah, lot. No, and, and, I, and I'd agree with that. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, especially in terms of the, the, this idea of the whole kind of downgrading thing. Um, and it, it's one of those things where one of my, uh, not pet peeves is probably too strong a word, but when people will say, oh, we've got pockets of best practice. And I'll say, okay. Does that mean that you're actually relying on an individual or a group of individuals who are, who are enthusiastic about this stuff 
anyway and they're bringing that into your organization or are you as an organization developing people and moving them on and the acid test is always if the person who's currently doing it left what would happen and, and, and all too often it fails yeah yeah um i mean the the classic example of this uh was i mean second life years ago and this, yeah, this yeah. didn't really impact on the schools at the time i don't think because second life originally they had like a, 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 a an adult 18 plus grit like area yeah. and they had like a teen area uh, but what we were finding is a lot of universities were jumping on that second life i call it a bandwagon they were jumping on it was going to be the next big thing but it was all very much about certain key members of staff in that organization yeah, yeah. and the second that member of staff for whatever reason left it just stopped there was no mm. kind of uh, inertia behind it at all, and and there are two there are two sort of thoughts that then occur to me. I've probably forgotten the second one already. But the, the one the one is I haven't is training. Mm. The one is st- strategy. Yeah. As at a school level, I, I'm not again. I'm not sure about this, but I had a conversation just this week about it. To what extent are head teachers currently strategically planning investment in IT and the corresponding investment in staff training to support that mm. use of technology? Mm. Mm. Because we all, I mean, I, I know, and you're, you're probably the same as well. You put a, te- a piece of kit into a child's hand, they pick it up and go with it. They know what to yes. do intrinsically. No, from any age now, really, essentially, from three-year-old up to 18-year-old. Yeah. You put it into a teacher's hand, and there's an immediate fear factor. Mm. I don't know what to do with this. Am I going to break it? Yeah. I don't know how it's going to change my style. So you've got to really have those two common threads. You know, you're talking about a three-year strategy in schools mm. and a training package that yeah. supports that. Mm. And then the money that supports that. Yes, yeah. And that's always a stumbling yeah. block. Well, Elizabeth, I think you, we talked about it um, previously, about mm. the Eddie Izzard was called it, was it Techno Joy? Techno Joy, yeah. As opposed to Techno, techno Fear. fear. Yeah, you can't break the internet, like, by accident. You have to try really hard. <laughs> so when people, like, get a new piece of kit, if they have Techno Joy, they'll just throw the manual away and go, I'm going to yeah. play with this. And Whereas other people have Techno Fear. And, yeah, they and... try something out and they're like, oh! Oh my god i've broken the internet and they you know, yeah. they haven't and if they just yeah it's that willingness to just press the button and see what happens yeah, yeah. totally just and do it the, th- the thing now is i mean i guess in the, back in the day when i was at school, when i was at school bbc micros and acorns and stuff you pressed the wrong button and the computer was dead mm. and mm. it would never recover from mm. that but it's okay though i've mm. killed a computer <laughs> it's okay <laughs> the rest of the world keeps functioning yeah. but, it, but it's not it's even if not... you nearly give yourself a heart attack <laughs> It's, it's not as big a deal now, is it? I mean, how many no. how many tablets can you actually kill with one inadvertent click? No, not many. I don't know. So, I mean, we talked about uh, kind of uh, strategy and, and staff yeah. uh, development. Um, do you find, I mean, obviously, you know, money's a, a, a fairly important factor. It's always going to be a driver, yeah. yeah. Um, what about time? I mean, do you find that uh, does staff have the... the the time for maybe I mean maybe it's not you know, technology but kind of just general staff development is that is that there is that a barrier is that it's, it, it's, it's going to be t- it, mm. um, I have my 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 uh my phrase time and money never mm. enough of one or the other yeah um, re- rarely do you have them balanced and and yeah I mean schools are massively pressured environments anyway. sure and, sure and the pressure is on schools is ever increasing with um the Welsh government's drive on standards mm. rightly so I hasten to add mm. um and yeah it's going to be hard to get that start of element time, but you just have to find the time. And it's not its not there now, no. I mean, mm. there's inset days that you can use, yeah. But, uh, for example, in Method Tidal, the inset days are used on, a, on another project for, yeah. that we need to use them for that's, that's non techy Sure. Because that's more important than the tech. Mm. So you are relying on, again, some goodwill. You know, teachers taking the technology home, like I said earlier, and playing with it over the weekend mm. and over the summer holidays. But, you know, you, you kind of should. It's a, it's a toy then, isn't it? It's yeah. something fun to play with. Yeah. And it's not always viewed in that way. Mm. But yeah, so strategically developing training, what tends to happen is you train a member of staff because you can release a member of staff more easily. Yeah. And then you expect that member of staff to cascade it down to everybody else. Sure. Through a staff meeting or through one-to-ones or whatever way that be. And, mm-hmm. that, and then that's just a risk, isn't it? And, and sometimes that pays off and sometimes that doesn't pay off. Mm. What about, I mean, I, I was over in the Welsh Assembly a couple of weeks back and they were talking about um, one of the issues certainly within... Oh, I can't, I know, get me, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I haven't and, been there yet. I haven't oh, had that privilege. Very nice. Um, <laughs> but they were talking about um, one of the challenges that schools face at the moment is this: is people use the word ICT as a catch-all. Yeah. Um, and one of the challenges they were saying was that actually, because it means different, so many different things to different people, no one actually can have two people having the, talking to one another, but they both think they're talking about completely different things. 
Have you noticed how I haven't used the term at all? Absolutely. Well. I didn't know. Yeah, that, I mean, that muscle's going to break because it hasn't come up. Um, no, no, I, and I, do you find that is it kind of prevalent? Uh, I, I, I still tie the... by ICT. Yeah, mm. And ICT in my head is information communication technology. Yeah. Mm. And actually, it's not, it's not a co joined word. It's information, communication, mm. and technology is three distinct mm. zones, sets, ideas, concepts. That's a better word. Mm. So, and I don't think that's the way that people think about it now. Certainly not the way I think about it. It's technology. It's not mm. about no. what it can do. Yeah. We all, yeah. I guess now, and this is perhaps distinct to five or even ten years ago, is that technology, when it does information, it does communication. Yeah. It, it doesn't really matter what tool you pick up. You don't need to learn to be up. taught how to do that with it. It mm. just does it. Yeah, I mean... It, there's so many different streams of learning with, with, with tech. Yeah. I yeah. use the tech and kit so much as being in my terms. Yeah. That's maybe just me. It, you know, it's about, um, is it about programming and developing new things? Is it about using existing applications already? Is it about um, playing and engaging with it? And it's that, you know, it's almost those three streams of consciousness and, mm. and concepts and ideas that is all that technology is about now. It's mm. not about those you know, does it do information? Yes. Does it, does it communicate? Yes! <laughs> it's called the internet! <laughs> <laughs> do you find that, I mean, again, uh, that we, we tend, when we're working with staff, we tend to find there's kind of two mindsets, even with those people who we say are uh, technologically confident. Yeah. There are the folks that have the mindset of how things were, let's say, maybe 10 years ago, when they're very focused on Microsoft Windows, Microsoft Office, that's ICT. And then you have, we tend to find the other folks who are like, oh, no, we're happy with Google Docs and we'll try a bit of Prezi and a bit of this and a bit of that. So the, the traditionalists and the innovators, dare well, they suggest. Well, you know. <laughs> but, I think there's still a third the group that are still not terribly comfortable with the first way, which is oh, why yeah. you get that, still get that focus on mm. Word and windows well, and... there's a massive number of people out there that just are not confident with technology full stop oh mm. yeah mm. that the, 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 in, in, i'm talking about people who are currently working not not retired people sure and, sure and, and even youngsters as well you know mm. absolutely have no interest no skill no mm. no desire no um training on it mm. and yeah deeply scared i was talking to someone just this morning about that exact thing that they can use a computer do they feel confident using microsoft office dot program not really yeah mm. no i've doing. worked with plenty of people like that and, mm. and, and actually the, the, the program i was talking about targeting them was essential skills mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah there we go essential agree. skills wales yeah. Yeah. yeah as it happens there we go there's the, the, the blatant plug for the plug. welsh government <laughs> <laughs> so what about uh, what's on the horizon for yourself at the moment is anything kind of uh, you're, that is exciting you that you think this is going to be uh, maybe a game changer or something that you're really enthused about. You think I can't wait to tell people about this. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a weird one because it's not. It is my job currently, but it's not actually doesn't fit with my job title. But that's okay. fine. So, it's, so my job title was school's ICT strategic manager. That was a mouthful. And what I've done is I've created a campaign for Merthyr Tydfil um, mm-hmm. that aims to promote initially reading. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do a four-year campaign. It's, it's driven by um, my head of school improvement, another shameless plug for Lorraine Buck, who's been a brilliant manager, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> and and so so what we've what we've done is this four-year campaign. We do reading, writing, maths, and IT as fo- focuses foci over mm-hmm. the four years. And the campaign has a website which is learning learningopensthemagicdoor.com. Brilliant. The idea being mm-hmm. that if you don't learn, if you can't read, you can't open the magic door to your career mm-hmm. and to your life. So I had an animator create a video. Wow. A proper commissioned animation, which was quite scary. Mm. <laughs> Commissions. Well, the Gareth's been awesome, and I've got these mm. two little characters, and they're going to be my um, my. If I start, so you're saying you're soft, soft launch, aren't you? Yeah. So we're in soft launch now. So these characters are out there, right, and okay. they are the beginning of a family, and the family will go through trials and tribulations and and uh, real life events during the course of the campaign that help um, and capture the, the problems that people are perhaps facing in their real life. Brilliant. Um, and really try and provide some solutions and some ideas and some thoughts about where you can go to for help and, yeah. and how you can move it on. Because ultimately, if you come from a, a non-reading background, a non-reading family, isn't that setting you up at a disadvantage when you hit school? Mm. Yeah, mm. hugely. And then that, that winds on, doesn't it? And just goes on and on and on and on. And on. So mm. it's about trying to making it a part of a, a social agenda as well as it just being an education agenda. Brilliant. So if um, <clears throat> we'll put a link to that up on Jeez. the podcast as well. <laughs> Um, so, Andrew, if people uh, want to get in touch with you, if you want, they want to learn more about the work that you do, what's the easiest way of them to kind of reaching out to making contact with you? Uh, I, I, 
be open to Twitter and email. Twitter and email. Okay. So Twitter is at, at Merthyr Advisor and email is andrew.williams at merthyr.gov.uk. Fantastic. Nice and simple. Brilliant. So, by all means, welcome to any offers. Um, and, and any support requests are also uh, welcome. I'll happily, I'm, I've, I said on my Twitter page, my, my, my bio, is it called? Yeah, yeah. Happy to help. Brilliant. Well, I mean, I thank you ever so much no for coming in to talk to us. It's been absolutely fantastic. Please hang up and try again. Okay, so uh, all that remains is to uh, say a very big thank you to our special guest for coming in and speaking to us today. So thank you very much indeed for coming in and, 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 and instigating a really useful and, and interesting conversation. So it's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, the, the offer. No problem at all. And finally, to say thanks very much to, uh, to the usual podcasters. Thanks, Paul, once again. Always a pleasure. And uh, to Elizabeth as well. You're quite welcome. And, uh, and yeah, basically, thanks very much for listening and uh, catch you next time. Oh.